going to share a quick story and then some thoughts uh, from the Gospel of John, chapter 15. So if you'd like to look for that while I'm sharing this, The Bible speaks out against hypocrisy. Jesus especially leaves little room for it. A holier-than-thou disposition in religious people was the target of the Lord's most intense attacks. So just an interesting thought there, so I'll share a little story related to that. The story is told about a corporate executive who lost his job. He was so depressed that he could not go home and tell his family what had happened. Instead, he took a long walk in a park and found a bench where he could sit and bemoan his sad fate. After a while, another man, equally depressed, came along and sat down at the other end of the same bench. He looked over and saw the corporate executive with his head in his hands and moaning and groaning to himself, and he could not help but ask, what's wrong with you? The executive said, I've lost my job. I can't go home and tell my family what's happened. They depend on me. And I, wouldn't be, and I won't be able to be the good provider I've always been. What's your problem? The second man said, I run a circus, and the main attraction has always been a huge and threatening gorilla. People come from all over to watch that gorilla rant and rage at them. Two days ago, the gorilla died, and I know my circus won't be able to survive the loss. Hey, said the corporate executive, you need a gorilla, and I need employment. I've got an idea. Why don't we skin the gorilla? and dress me up in its skin and let me tr take a try at pretending. We've got nothing to lose, why not take the chance? The agreement was made and the deed was done. In the days that followed, the corporate executive dressed in the gorilla skin and, ra and raged more than the real gorilla ever had. His antics were such that the crowds coming to the circus grew larger and larger and both men were making a fortune. Then one day, by sheer accident, a lion ended up in the same cage with the phony gorilla. The crowds gathered to see this incredible confrontation. The lion and the gorilla circled each other as people waited to see what will happen. Finally, the gorilla realized he was cornered and that there was no escape, and he yelled at the top of his lungs, Help! Help! The lion shouted, shouted back, Shut up! You're not the only one out of a job. <laughs> Sooner or later, our pretenses are always stripped away and we are exposed for who we really are. Just a principle to remember that uh, God will only allow us to pretend so long and then we will be exposed and for our benefit, right? No, no one prospers when they're pretending to be something that they are not. So let's turn to the Gospel of John chapter 15, and I'll read from verse 1. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you, Father. Lord, that we would look into your word, Lord, with humble hearts. And Lord, there's no need for us to pretend in the presence of you. You see everything that we are. And uh, Lord, it's not very good. But being filled with your Holy Spirit, we are of infinite value. Lord, that you looked at us and said, this is a vessel that I will fill. This is the pearl of great price that I will give everything up. And that you even did not withhold your son from us, Lord, to redeem us. Lord, it's a love that is beyond our comprehension but we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that it abide in the vine. No more can you, except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. 
If a man abide not in me, or woman, by the way, but if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them up and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Continue you in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, that your joy might be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father, I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that you should go forth and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, that you love one another. Just some things to look at here. You know, in, in verse 8, Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. And as I begin to research this a little bit, um, very few, and I like to go and read messages by other pastors and everything, but I've found that when you get back into the older guys, A.B. Simpson and A.W. Tozer and these, these old guys from, from years back, they seem to have a great understanding of God's grace. It's amazing because there's truly nothing, nothing new under the sun. And they understood the fact that when you are a branch, all you do is hang on a tree, Right? that the branch doesn't go under the ground in, in, in seeking from water. What the branch does, it hangs there on the vine, waiting for the roots to bring nutrition and water through the vine to it. And then the fruit is a natural byproduct of that. And it's interesting, as I looked at most of the mo teachings of modern pastors, that they focus on the fruit but they teach very little about the root. And it's a gospel of you need to try harder and do better, which winds up being a work of the flesh that burns out very quickly. But as in, I believe it's in Ezekiel or, or uh, Zechariah that Chris is teaching through in Zechariah, the source was a living source of two olive trees and the, the candle would burn forever because it was tapped in to the living source of the olive trees. That's the way that we are. We are tapped into a living source that continually nourishes us that we don't have to struggle in our flesh, but we will bear fruit naturally because of the source that we are trapped into, tapped into. So let's talk a little bit about root. What is a root? What is a root of a tree? I remember at one place we lived, there was an enormous apple tree. And apple trees usually don't get that large, but this apple tree, it was not that tall, but it was full. I mean, it was just like the biggest tree around, and there were a bunch of little apples on it. And I remember we had a very windy time, and it blew this tree over. I'm sure that Brian probably remembers this tree. It blew, the wind blew this tree over, and this tree was loaded with these apples, these, these small green apples. But the tree, when it blew over, had hardly any roots to it. It was amazing how this tree had filled out the way it had, but the roots all ran very shallowly along the top of the ground. 
and it just the wind just ripped that right out of the ground and laid it right over. What is a root? Well, a actual definition, it's the descending axis of a plant, usually growing underground, providing support and absorbing moisture from the soil. Or another thing is that which from which something derives its origin, growth, life, etc. So it's interesting that this analogy is made of Christ being the vine and us the branches. Root can also be a verb, to put down roots and begin to grow. Uh, don't we kind of say that? It's like I say, I will, never, I will likely never move away from this, this area. Why? Because I've put down roots here. You know, three of my four children live here in this area. My church is here. My friends are here. And it's very likely I will never leave this place because I have put down roots here. I, the house that I own is here. It's to be firmly fixed or established. So what is fruit? Fruit is the seed-bearing part of a plant. Fruit's necessary for the plant to reproduce. Typically has the seeds in it. An edible, usually seed-bearing plant product especially sweet, especially a sweet and succulent one. A consequence, it also could be a consequence or an outcome or a result. Have you ever heard the old saying, you've made your bed, so now you lie in it? In other words, you're reaping the fruits of what you've sown. It can be good or bad. It's a consequence or an outcome. But speaking of fruit, as the Bible speaking of it, the fruit from a tree. A fruit always requires death. It didn't just happen to be, that tree didn't just happen to be there. And the usual order of things is that death occurs at the end of life. But the difference with Christ is that Christ's death was, is the beginning of life. It's a very interesting concept that at Christ's death, life for us began. That it's a conflict of the way in, in our thinking of the way things work, in that life can come out of death. I always think, okay, I was born, I will live, if I'm fortunate and uh, by the grace of God, to 80 something years, and then I die. That's the order of things. With Christ, the order is reversed. But fruit requires death. Death comes before a fruit. John 12, 24. Jesus said, truly, truly, I say to you, except a corn of wheat or a grain of wheat, it falls into the ground and dies, it abideth alone. It's a simple fact of sowing and reaping. If we have and what it means it abides alone, that means that's all that there's going to be. The principle of sowing and reaping. If I've got a bag of kernels of corn and my decision is, is that I grind them up and I make some cornbread, that's all I'm going to have, right? That cornbread, it may be good and I may enjoy that, but that is all I'm going to have. But if I take that corn and I plant that corn, I sow that seed, it falls into the ground, and it actually dies. That it's interesting because there's just one little part of that seed that actually is it's called the germ that actually bears the life of the seed. The rest of it dies and decays, and it becomes food for the portion of the seed that has the life. The Amplified version of this says, I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just one grain. It never becomes more, but it's by itself. It's alone. But if it dies, it produces many others and yields a rich harvest. It's interesting the way this works. Because Christ is reaping a rich harvest through his death. 
And that's a perfect example. It's a type of the Lord Jesus who had life in himself, but who, when he was put into the grave, he rose on the third day. And it also signifies the believer who has God's eternal life in him. You see, when I say that death is essential to bear fruit, 2 Corinthians 5.17 talks about this. It said, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. What does it say? This says that I no longer have to identify myself through my failures of my past. You see, someone who has known me all my life and knows me well could tell you much failures, many failures that I've experienced. They could tell you many things that are wrong with me today even. But because I am in Christ, I am a new creature. I am a new creation of Christ. I live a life that is apart from the natural life where I fail over and over again. I have a spiritual life that is viewed by God in Christ that sees me perfect. And I no longer have to live with condemnation of the weakness of my flesh. I no longer have to identify myself as this. Old things must pass away. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature, a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. This little piece of corn, this little seed, or any type of fruit that you talk about, that you put it in the ground, the outer part of it decays and passes away. But this little germ that they call it, which contains the life, grows to produce much fruit. Fruit requires roots. Another principle. Fruit requires roots. There was a story of this vineyard that always produced far and this was actually I forget who who told of this but there, I, and I forget the name of it but it was A.B. Simpson or, or one of these old pastors that I was telling you about but he talks about a vineyard that produced so much more grapes than what was was normal and it gathered a lot of attention that, uh, that this vineyard would always produce so much more and as they studied this, they found out that the root structure of these grapevines was such that it had traveled many feet underground and there was an actual pool of water that it had tapped into. And because that it was tapped into this pool of water, that it produced so much fruit. And we see that the root is the principal structure of bearing fruit. Without roots, death is absolutely certain. Death is absolutely certain. If you plant the tree and there's no roots and nowhere for the roots to grow, the plant's going to die. Like the apple tree that I talked about that was blown over when the wind came because of not having sufficient roots. Matthew 13, 5 talks about sowing seed. And some of the seed fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forth, forth with they sprung up. But because they had no deepness of earth, and when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. There was no place for the roots to grow. And there was probably nothing in the heart of this hearer when the word of the, of the gospel, when the seed of the gospel was scattered there, that would enable him to perceive or understand God's word. And Jesus describes this as that heart or that soul that sits unmoved under the sound of the gospel. And we can't judge who this is. But I can tell you there are people that... I have presented the gospel to 
that it's like talking to, talking to this piece of wood. And they're unmoved by it whatsoever and have no appreciation for it. And it's interesting because I was thinking recently, I saw a post on Facebook. Um, and I try to not be on Facebook too much, but I saw a post from somebody that was raised in this church that I've known for years that was very anti-Christian, very against Christian, that spoke of this Christian conspiracy and, and uh, exalting ungodliness. And I'm thinking, what is the difference in two people being raised under similar circumstances in a church with godly parents and the likeness that I'm always, I've always been given is that you have the lump of clay or the lump of butter and the sun, same sun shines on both but the butter will melt and the clay will harden and that's the way with the hearts of people if we do not place our faith in Christ that our heart will not be melted under the heat of the gospel, but will become hard as a stone. And that's the way the gospel fell upon these stony, the seed fell on these stony places. And maybe it would even be appreciated for a very short time, but because of no roots. Matthew 13, 20 says, He that received the seed in stony places, the same as he that hears the words, and with joy receives it, yet he has not root in himself, and he has it for a while, but when tribulation or persecution comes because of the word, by and by he is offended. And how many people will renounce their faith by a simple offense? And I can tell you, if you're around imperfect people, you're going to be offended at times. And it may even be by me. And with no intent... Someone can say something that will offend me and I'll be, I could be offended if I choose to dwell in that. But we have to say that because of the love of God in my life, it covers a multitude of offenses and sins. Likewise, to destroy a tree, you start with the roots. And Matthew 3.10 says, And now also the axe is laid into the root of the trees. Therefore, Every tree which bringeth forth not good fruit is cut down and cast into the fire. What does this mean? This means that the things in my life that are not profitable, those things that would cause my heart to be hard, those things that are unprofitable growing like a tree in me that is not the tree of life, will put roots down in my heart. And the Word of God is the axe that is laid to the root to destroy these things in my life that need to go. They're cut down. It's a purging process. Maybe it's an unhealthy relationship that I have. Maybe it is an unhealthy habit that I have in my life that God wants to purge from me. And the work of the Word of God and through His Holy Spirit will work in me to purge this from me, to prune like the husbandman or the gardener prunes the vine. And these things will be taken and they will be burned so they cannot reoccur. Math Mark eleven thirteen says, And seeing a fig tree afar off, having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And it represents Israel in her natural position. This tree it was representing Israel. And in the morning, and in, in 11, verse 20 said, In the morning as they passed by, they saw the fig tree dried up from the roots. Speaking again of Israel, that the pruning that had to go on there because of the idolatry and the following after idols and no depth of root in the Lord. No depth of root, there will be no fruit. The, the depth of the root is going to de determine 
the fruit. And Matthew 13, 5 says, Some fell upon stony places, for they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up, and because they had no deepness of earth, when the sun was up, they were scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. But there is also good ground in verse 8, Matthew 13, 8. But others fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, some thirtyfold. Amazing that when you think from one ear of corn that there could be hundreds of ears of corn harvested because of that. The goodness of this last soil, it, it, it consists of the goodness and the willingness to receive the gospel. The location of the root determines the health of the tree and the fruit. It must have access to water. Remember I shared about the vineyard where the roots grew and as these roots grew, they found water. Here's some scriptures that speak of this. Hebrews 12, 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then verse 15. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. Talking about the root tapping into water instead of something that is unhealthy because it can tap into bitterness and then it will bring forth bad fruit. But we abide in the vine. We receive the love of God as that water, that healthy water that is going to bring forth good fruit, not a root of bitterness John 15, 4, abide in, abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except that abide in the vine, no more can you, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit, for without me you can do nothing. You see, if a preacher stands up here and preaches. If I stand up here and I preach and I say, you need to do this and you need to do that and you need to do better. You need to try harder. This is what you need to do. I'm wasting my time because the message of the gospel is this. What Jesus just shared, he said, what you need to do is be tapped into the vine. If you do that, it's not about trying. It is about bearing fruit naturally because of the nutrition that you take in. Ephesians 3.17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth the length, the depth, and the height, and to know the love of Christ, which patheth knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Do I need to struggle to do this? No, I need to abide. I need to be simply plugged in to this vine. Colossians 2.6 as you have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk you in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. I found out that thanksgiving is very important because in being thankful for what the Lord has given me, I will prosper in what has been given to me. Rather than looking at someone else who I see may have more materially, or maybe they have a greater intellect, or maybe they had more opportunities in life, there's no limit to those things that we can look at and not be thankful for what we have been given. But we will know the love of God when we walk 
in these things, established in faith and abounding in the love of Christ with thanksgiving. Psalms 1-3, and he shall be, speaking of the, of the one who is established in Christ, he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth fruit in his season. You see, if the fruit's not there, we don't need to be too concerned because if we are plugged into the vine, the fruit is going to come when the season is right. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he does shall prosper. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, Blessed is the man that trusts in the Lord, and whose hope the Lord is. For he shall be as a tree planted by the waters, and that spreadeth out his roots by the river, and shall not see when heat cometh. But the leaf shall be green, and shall not be careful in the year of drought. Neither shall cease from yielding fruit. So what is the application of this? When we teach all these principles, we can say, well, okay, this, I understand the concept. How do I apply this? How does this impact me personally in my life? Because truly, there are many things that I understand that I'm not able to make practical use of. You see, knowledge, the world will say knowledge is power. And I would say that knowledge is separate from power in this. That if I was a quadriplegic, I may know how to drive a car, but if I don't have arms and legs, I'm not going to just get in the car and drive it, right? I may have knowledge how to do something without the opportunity to do it. I may have knowledge, but yet I don't have the ability or even the desire to do something. But this is how we apply these things because we have many things that come against us as Satan will try to convince us that we cannot apply the Word of God. Maybe we are short on money. Maybe our health is not good. Maybe we have a busy schedule and we don't feel the need to fellowship with other Christians or, or whatever. But I can say this. We can begin to plant our roots in a local church. And I would say to anyone, there are many good churches around. And if it's not for someone to plant their roots here, we would love to have whoever would the Lord leads here. But find a local church to plant the roots. As we are in the Word of God and we plant roots in the Word of God, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. And we begin to function as we mature as Christians and we begin to be like that tree that is firmly planted that we begin to have leaves. We begin to bear fruit and we minister in our local church. We support our brothers and sisters here. We support those on the mission field. We begin to bear those fruits and what is fruit? So we say we're going to bear fruit. Well, first off, I want to say about fruit, uh, just like a general definition of it, it's the deposit of sap. It's the final result of the inner activities of the tree. Fruit is the outcome of hidden life within a vine or a tree, beginning with the root, that life begins with the root. It passes through the stem into the branch. It finally manifests itself in the bud, the blossom, and the fruit. And this is the life cycle. It's the life cycle of a Christian. It's the life cycle of a tree. We would say that it's governed by laws. Now, what do we say laws are? Laws are something that always bring about a, a specific end. Law of gravity, right? We've used this one many times. Law of gravity says that this book will eventually, this Bible will eventually go downward, right? I can defy this for a little while. But as I hold this out, I will begin to tire. And when we resist the laws of God, 
eventually we begin to tire and they begin to take over. Well, this is a law, and it's a law to bring about a good result. The life cycle of bearing fruit, it's determined by laws that God put in place. And they can't be altered. And it came to pass, number 17, 8 says, that on the morrow Moses went into the tabernacle of witness. And behold, the rod of Aaron for the house of Levi was budded and brought forth buds and bloomed blossoms and yielded almonds. Now this is really something that is one of the miracles of the Bible. What is this rod of Aaron? It's a big stick. He's been carrying this thing around for years. It's a big old dead stick. No doubt that the bark was worn off of it and it was a big old staff. It was the one that he spread out over the Red Sea and part of the waters and he carried with him now he goes into the tabernacle Moses goes in the rod of Aaron it budded and it brought forth buds and it bloomed blossoms it had the flowers on it and it yielded almonds it's a miracle because we see life coming out of death signifying Christ, life coming out of his death. But this is, this is the order that things go in. There is a budding process. The Holy Spirit starts this budding process when I get saved, when I am born again, when old things have passed away and I become a new creation in Christ Jesus. When my faith is in Christ and new life is in me, I begin to bud. And people will look at me and say, wow, is this the same person that had no faith? That was this type of person before. I'm beginning to see something. There is a sign of life there. There is little buds. Then there's the blossoming the blossoming. Romans 5 3 says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope makes not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which is given unto us. A work of the Holy Spirit begins this budding process in us. In 1 Peter 5.10 says, But the God of all grace, who has called us unto eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a while, will make you perfect. Establish, strengthen, and settle you. You see, I go through a crisis many times at first when I'm a young Christian and, and newly saved. And I go through a crisis in that there are things going in my life. But after... I've suffered for a while. He establishes me, strengthens me, settles me, and I begin to mature as a Christian. That is the blossoming process that I go through. I begin to blossom, and there begins to be flowers that are very noticeable in my life. We see the flowers come forth. And then there is the fruit bearing. Galatians 5.22 says, But the fruit of the Holy Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. You see, God is expecting fruit-bearing as he gives to us, as the Holy Spirit gives to us severally as he wills we see that he brings forth the fruit you see we can live up to our potential not by struggling and trying harder but simply by being planted and rooted according to God's word because he provides the roots and he provides the life the sap and we need to only be in the vine 
You see, one thing we see is that fruit bearing does take time. And we follow God and we allow the Holy Spirit to bring us into the season of fruiting. And then finally, I'll close with this last scripture. But John 15, 2 says, Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. We're going to go through pruning processes because, as I said, that he is not going to allow things in our lives that are unprofitable if we are desiring to bear fruit. But those who are pretending, like the lion and the gorilla in the story they shared at first, they will be exposed if they're not truly placed their faith in Christ. If they're not, if they're pretenders and not truly born again, that will be exposed also. Because Jesus said those, or the Apostle Paul said, those that were with us that are no longer with us, they're no longer with us because they were not truly of us. They were the ones who were the pretenders. But for those of us who have placed our faith in Christ, allow his roots to nourish us. Allow that vine to provide us with what we need. Fellowship with others in the body. Uphold one another. Share the love of Christ with each other. Be gracious to those who may offend us and love them. Give them the benefit of the doubt and love them with the love of Christ.